Hey everybody, this is Mr. Farmer with AP Macroeconomics. Today's topic, ample versus limited reserves. Up front, I have the reserve graph, and we're going to first go through and break down why it looks this way and what it means. So first off, what are limited reserves? So a little history, prior to 2008, the Federal Reserve utilized limited reserves. This meant that the bank simply did not have an excessive amount of money available. So what's the significance? Changing the supply of money had a large impact on banks, and we saw this in things like the money market graph. Changing the supply of money, the SM to SM2, would change the interest rates, either increase or decrease. Changing supply of loanable funds, the excess reserves of the banks, would change the interest rates for when you borrow money. So all these monetary policies, open market operations, discount rates, reserve requirements, the targeting of the federal funds, they played a really large role in managing banking systems, interest rates, and therefore how customers would be more likely to borrow money or to invest money, things like the money market graph. So again, the limited reserves from College Board, that's pretty much talking about changing supply of money, and we typically see this in things like the local funds graph and the money market graph, and also reserve requirement conversations. So the reserve graph, the way I can remember it is the reserve portion of the reserve graph, or the limited reserve portion, is this downward sloping demand curve. And so we can kind of think, well, you know, the money market graph has a downward sloping demand, and changing the supply of money really changes the interest rates associated with that. And hey, the limited reserve section, this downward portion section, is also downward sloping. So again, this means that changing the interest or the supply of money really has a large impact on the interest rates. Now, quick note, on the reserve graph, the interest rate we're predominantly trying to figure out is this federal funds rate. What interest would a commercial bank lend money to another commercial bank? Based on limited reserves, it's at the intersection of the supply and the demand. So decrease in supply increases that intersection point, so that would increase the federal funds rate. And decreasing or increasing supply of money would then decrease the interest rates. What's the significance? Well, if I'm a bank and I have to borrow at a, let's say, a higher interest rate to, uh, from the, another commercial bank, then I'm probably going to charge my customers a higher interest rate as well. So this can indirectly influence how people, how banks work with their customer base. Okay. Ample versus limited. So the limited is what we're talking about. It's this downward sloping portion. What's the ample reserve? It's on this last little segment. It's where it's flat. So we can see from this is things like changing supply of money. It plays a role. It changes interest rates on this limited portion. How about the ample? This other portion, this downward sloping. Well, changing supply of money doesn't really change the interest rates. So the question becomes, if we, the Fed, are trying to influence how banks interact with them, if I'm trying to expand or contract the economy, changing supply to influence that federal funds rate, well, it no longer plays a role, no longer does what we need it to. So what can I do? We're going to get to that. First, let's talk about how did we end up here? How do we end up at this ample reserve concept? Well, again, another history lesson. 2008, the United States had the Great Recession. The rest of the world had a world financial crisis as well, so other places are definitely in the same scenario. So here we have the percent change in real GDP. In 2008, the real GDP decreased a whole bunch. Um, and so we had like a negative 4% GDP change. So in about... 2009, 2010, we started getting out of it. So now we're at a positive change just for that year of, I don't know, 2%. But again, 2% percent change of real GDP, that's just the ongoing target for kind of maintenance of stuff, for increasing production, economic growth. It's about 2%. So we went from a negative 2, 3, maybe 4%, and then we went back to our normal status. 
Well, that really didn't do enough. So the Federal Reserve had used expansionary monetary policies. They'd set this federal funds rate to near zero as their target to try and get people to just lend people money as cheap as you can. Okay, so we started to get out of it a little bit, but it, it still needed more. So between 2008 and 2014, so about 2014 around here, the Fed conducted a series of large-scale asset purchase programs. The goal was to decrease longer-term interest rates. So we saw previously, if you increase supply of money, banks will charge a lower interest rates. And then people can borrow more money for cheaper. So they will borrow more money for cheaper. They will then spend more money, and we're stimulating the economy. So this is referred to as aggressive, because it was very large, quantitative easing, meaning the open market operations. Just how large were these things? Well, the programs increased the Fed's asset holdings from $15 billion in 2007 to $2.7 trillion in late 2014. Now, again, there's a thousand billions in a trillion. And if we kind of simplify our conversation, say each one of these assets is a dollar, then in 2007 there was $15 billion of currency in the U.S. economy. Within seven years, that increased to $2.7 trillion. That would be $2,700 billion in late 2014. Yeah, at that point, the reserves, meaning the amount of money available to the banks, was ample. It was more than enough. So, here's the graph simplified. Pre-2008, that's limited reserves. That's this downward sloping portion. Post-2008, we have ample reserves. That would be the $2.7 trillion uh, in U.S. securities. Okay. Okay. So supply changes of money don't really impact it. So what can the Fed now do? Well, they're given a new superpower. Okay, I love my origin stories. I love comic books. So let's talk about the Fed's origin story for their newest superpower called interest on reserves. Now, in 2006, Congress gave the Federal Reserve authority to pay interest on reserve for the start date of 2011 because of what was going on in 2008 the Great Recession, housing crisis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Congress said you can actually start in 2008. So what is what are IORs, interest on reserves? Well, the Federal Reserve was given authority, it's their new superpower, to pay commercial banks interest for money held in the bank's reserves. Essentially, if a bank didn't lend out their money, whatever money they didn't lend out, they get their interest on us. This is the interest on reserves. And the Federal Reserve pays for that. Now, originally, there's actually two different interest on reserves, interest on required reserves and interest on excess reserves. Well, as of 2020, because of the COVID pandemic and the sharp decline, you can see here just a huge decline of interest rates in the pandemic, just trying to stimulate the economy. Um, the Federal Reserve changed reserve requirements to zero. This essentially meant that all reserves held by bank, by definition, were excess. So as of now, we just have interest on reserves, which you can see in 2021, it goes to blue because that's just interest on reserve. You don't have this required excess. They're discontinued. Now, um, actions were taken from 2014 to reduce the reserves holdings um, of securities. It didn't quite decrease the ampleness, but they, they did try to decrease a little bit uh, to an extent. Okay. Now this whole concept really stimulates around or goes around the idea of arbitrage. Now this is not a new thing to the banking sector by any means, but it's a very important concept within the current ample reserve banking system. So arbitrage is the simultaneous buying and selling of securities, currency, or commodities in different markets or in derivative forms in order to take advantage of differing prices for the same asset. What did that mean? Well, it means you might be like an arbitrage trader. What does this mean? The person, the trader, they have information. That's about it. And they're going to use it to their profit. They find exchange A is selling a good for, let's say, $1,000. 
and the trader knows in exchange B the same good sells for 1050 So what are they going to do? Buy an exchange A, sell an exchange B, and they keep their profit. That's it. Nothing crazy, nothing new. So what role does that play in our ample reserve system? Well, we got to remember two things. One, the federal funds rate. Federal funds rate is the interest rate banks charge other banks when borrowing money from each other. Two, the interest on reserves, the new thing from today, is the interest rate bank rate banks can earn by holding on to reserves. So here's the scenario. Let's say we have a couple banks here, Bank A, B, and the Federal Reserve itself. So if a, Bank A sets its Federal Funds rate to 2%, and the Fed sets their interest rate to 3%, what would you do if you were bank B? Think about that. What would you do? Well, what I think is obvious is you're going to borrow money from bank A and you're going to pay back 2%. You're then going to hold reserves and get paid 3% from the Fed. Therefore, bank B is guaranteed profit of 1% and they're not even using any of their own money. They just pocket 1%. This is the idea of arbitrage. So, with this in mind, let's consider if the interest on reserve is set at 3% by the Federal Reserve, what do you think the minimum federal funds rate, which is set by the commercial banks themselves, so it's set by Bank A, what do you think the minimum federal funds rate Bank A would accept for the reserves being lent out? I'd say 3%, probably a little above actually, because why would they lend it 3% to Bank B instead of just gaining 3% straight from the Fed? So probably a little bit above, honestly, but for uh, us, we're just going to use a general policy rate, and it's going to be kind of communal for federal funds rate and interest on reserves for College Board at least. So it's for this reason that the interest on reserve sets this minimum portion of the reserve. The graph to the right is one from College Board, at least. So again, they're using just generally policy rate or administrative rate. So the interesting question of this whole thing is, where is the federal fund rate going to be? The ceiling in the United States is based on the discount rate. This is because a commercial bank would not charge above a federal funds rate. Why? If there's a bank charging a federal funds rate up here, nobody else is going to borrow money from them because I can always borrow from the Federal Reserve right here. So the discount rate becomes the ceiling. This is true in both the limited reserve, this downward portion part, and also in the AMP reserve. Although in the AMP reserve, the discount rate doesn't play a huge role because you never can get it to there. The interest on reserve is then the floor of this whole conversation. Why? Because of that whole arbitrage thing we were just talking about. If I'm going to charge you 2% and you can bought, and you can have an interest on reserve at 3%, you never, you'd always do that. You'd always just borrow money from me and make 1% from me. So the changes to the floor or ceiling would have an impact on the lending practices. The ceiling just kind of squishes it down. So not a huge role for the ample reserve, but for the limited reserve, it plays a role. But changing the floor, change that interest on reserve, that's going to increase the federal funds rate. And if you're charging more to other commercial banks, you're probably going to charge more to your customers. And if customers have to pay more in interest when they borrow money, we can go back to like the investment demand curve at this point, if you have to pay more in interest, you don't borrow as much. And so you can cool down the economy by increasing that interest on reserve or vice versa, lower the interest on reserves. And so we can see this happen. Okay, so I have the, uh, the Federal Reserve's uh, interest on reserve and excess reserves from about 2008 is when it first started. Okay, it was when the first kind of they got the superpower to about 2019. And we can see there's kind of three different sections. This blue part, they decreased the interest on reserve in the federal funds rate. The small part, there's no change. It was just very, very, very low at zero to about 0.5% over here on the right-hand side. And then you can see 2016 and 2019, right before the pandemic hit, we have increases over here. So what are they trying to do? 
Well, when they're decreasing these interest rates, they're trying to expand the economy. They're trying to stimulate the economy. Just get us going. So by decreasing these amounts, how could these policies affect the bank's policy with their customers? The banks would decrease as well. Now, why didn't the banks just keep a really high interest rate? Again, they're competitive with each other. Perfect competition, monopolist competition. I'll let you think about that. But the idea is that there were enough banks and lenders, they all need to be competitive with each other, and so you couldn't keep it as super high interest rates. In this middle part, it just kind of stayed level. It stayed very low. They were just trying to make sure the economy was okay. And then about 2015, 16, we started to cool down the economy, okay, and trying to pay back some debts as well. And so we started increasing. So an increase in these are contractionary policies. They're trying to cool down try to make it more expensive to borrow money or trying to increase opportunity cost of holding money or not holding money actually it was things for like the money market graphs put more money into these interest bearing accounts and don't spend it as much so that increase is going to be contractionary decrease in these are going to be expansionary so here we have the ASAD. We're above full employment. My actual is above my LRAS. So if the Fed wants to try and cool down the economy in an ample reserve policy, what would they do? Increase or decrease the interest on reserves? Think about that for a second. Answer, increase. So we're gonna increase again for college board, just increase policy rate or increase administrative rate that's fine by increasing the interest on reserves commercial banks would either raise interest rates they charge their customers since they would get guaranteed returns from the fed at the interest on reserves they're going to charge more for the federal funds rate to each other because that whole arbitrage thing and therefore probably charge their customers more as well Quick little fallback, if the interest on reserves and thus the federal funds rate increases, how does this impact the bond markets? This is a very common thing for college board to kind of attach a lot of different things is attaching interest rates and then let's go one step further of bonds. Answer, well, because you told me the interest rate should increase, then the price of bonds currently existing, already existing, would decrease. We just need to remember that relationship. All right, hope that helped talking about the versus reserve market. Talking about this downward sloping is the limited. The flat part is the ample. The ceiling of this is the discount rate. The bottom portion is the interest on reserve. Again, those are US-based terms, so we can use policy rate in general. And this whole graph identifies the federal funds rate. Where is it going to be? All right, until next time.